good evening, good night to the listeners and the Facebook viewers of DBS Radio. We are here live in the Kalinago territory to bring to you live coverage of the SSLR project discussion on the Kalinago culture. And um, we are about to start these proceedings, but um, we would like to give you an insight and an overview as to what the SSLR project is all about. And the Ministry of Environment and Kalinago Upliftment, along with the UNDP, creating a wider debate and raise public awareness of the Kalinago's heritage, their impact on Dominica and the island's future as the first climate resilient country in the world. These discussions will also provide critical information for the drafting of coloring and comic books to distribute it among the entire school population in Dominica. SSLR is also known to be strengthening sustainable livelihoods and resilience. It is aimed to strengthen the livelihoods and resilience of the Kalinago territory by working with the government in delivering an integrated package of support to strengthen capacities to boost agricultural production and sustainable agricultural practices. It is also aimed at developing a comprehensive Kalinago tourism strategy and brand that generates new income opportunities for the territory and boosts institutional capacities of the Kalinago Council for improved decision making and planning. So, um, this evening, you know, um, we have a few guests on the panel, moderated by His Honorable Kozia Fedrick. And the SSLR project will also provide equipment and material to support the construction of a smart plant and indigenous tree propagation facility. It will also provide technical assistance for product development and the marketing of cassava and provide small grants to support Kalinago farmers with cassava cultivation and cassava product development, with emphasis to be given to securing that at least 55% of the beneficiaries are women farmers. Furthermore, this project aims to support the update of the reforestation strategy for the Kalinago territory, develop a community livelihoods program for the reforestation of four water catchment areas to help conserve and protect the rainforest and traditional trees. The program will also assist with sensitizing residents of the Kalinago territory on issues of biodiversity. A comprehensive indi indigenous gender sensitive tourism strategy and Kalinago brand is designed and handed for its implementation to the government of Dominica. The strategy development process will ensure the active participation of women, elders, youth, and other vulnerable groups at the stages in all activities. The tourism strategy will also guarantee the inclusion of initiatives that will empower and benefit women and girls. This component of the project will support the integration and participation of members of the Kalinago Council in international and regional seminars and forums on indigenous people, including the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Peoples. The project will also provide technical experts to support the Kalinago Council. The, digital, the digitalization and conservation of Kalinago Council archives, which currently available for physical means, will then be upgraded to digital data so that the, it will be able to be saved and stored for future generations to know the history and the culture and the heritage of the Kalinago people. And it gives us great pleasure from the DBS standpoint as we bring you live coverage of this SSLR project on the Kalinago culture, moderated by the Honorable Kose Fedrick. And we will now take it to the head table for, the, for tonight's proceedings as we say good night and welcome the Honorable Kose Fedrick. Mabrika, Mabrika. Um, good evening, good night, good night to, to the listeners on, on, on DBS Radio. And this edition of, of um, Indigenous Voices is right here live in the Kainago space. And uh, my co-host, um, Nichi Abu, has, has been relieved for this evening. So I will take full control of the program tonight. And we, as we continue to have the conversation, 
and speaking to the importance of Karinago heritage and tradition in the development of Waiti Kubuli. And so I welcome you this evening on Indigenous Voices on DBS Radio to the youth webinar on Kalinago. Last evening we had a wonderful conversation with um, some academics and historians, uh, with Claudia Sanford, Jumadin, Frederick and Jason Jones. And so tonight the conversation will continue. And in the coming weeks we will seek to engage women, cultural activists, and other persons, people across the, the, the Karinago space. And on, usually on, on, on a Friday night like this uh, in the studios of DBS Radio, I give a, pre a brief update of my week, so I'll do it briefly before we, we go into the, the, the meat of the matter. Um, so the, during the course of this week, I was able to, to participate in a wonderful workshop um, conducted by the CDB in the project seeking to build resilience and adaptive capacity to climate change and island and this, sorry, disaster risk in the Kainago Territory on Monday and Tuesday. We had a cross-section of professionals across the island who contribute and interact with the Kainago space. Also this week I had the opportunity to, 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 to prepare and launch for publication our national forest policy of 2022. I've been able to, to go around the community also and look at the new homes um, built by the European Union funds and also by the World Bank uh, under the Housing Recovery Project and also to look at all of the wonderful work happening on the road, the East Coast Road. So I'm very excited to be here tonight and Indigenous Voices and, and we, are, we are live on Emo News and also we have GIS doing, doing some archival recording and DBS Radio Live here. Our sponsor for, for, for the event um, the, the, the Indigenous Voices, DSL, I want to thank you, and thank GIS, the UNDP staff, the Ministry of Environment, Kanago Upliftment, and Rural Modernization staff, and also Emo News. I just want to thank and welcome um, our, our, our sort of introducer, can I say that, Washler? Um, 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 Gregory Rabes Washler, and also, most, most importantly, the panelists of very young people here. And just to say, uh, we have Chief Lawrence Sanford here, Councillor um, Coffey, Devon Coffey, um, Ferdinand Valman, and also a teacher. Uh, so we have gender equality here. Gender, it's we have uh, addressed the gender situation. Alexia Burton, a teacher, and to say that um, Chief Lawrence represented um, the youth of the Kailago at the Youth Parliament this week. So I just want to 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 hats off for that for that intervention and to show that we have we do have leadership within the Kainago space. So at this point without any further ado, I would like to call on um um Washler, Gregory Rabes to to um introduce the the rest of the proceedings of this evening. And uh, once again welcome tonight to this program and um, I'm very happy that you, you could find time to listen on your cars, in your homes, on on, on your in, in the bars, in the shop. And you, you may have other things to do, but you, if you tune in, we are very excited because it's going to be a wonderful conversation with the youth as we speak about Kalinago heritage and culture and how it has impacted and continue to impact the Kalinago space and the entire white Kubilian society. Washla, take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much. Honorable Frederick. Good evening, Mabrika, Mabrika, uh, to all the listeners and viewers to this webinar. Of course, um, welcome again to our small audience here, supporting audience. We have the panelists, welcome as well. And uh, Kozia Frederick, who is doing uh, the moderation of the panel. So my, jo my job here is basically to give a background to the project which is called Sustainable Livelihoods and Resilience in the Kalinago Territory and to give you um, some detail about uh, why the webinar in the first place and also to give you a better knowledge of who the panelists are in terms of their background. To begin with the, the wider the project the, it's, which is called Strengthening Sustainable Livelihoods and Resilience in the Kalinago Territory. This project is focused primarily on the Kalinago 
community which is home to the largest indigenous grouping in the Eastern Caribbean. This project is funded by the government of India through the India-UN Development Partnership and implemented by the United Nations Development Program in close collaboration with various partners uh, which include the Kalinago Council, the government of the Commonwealth of Dominica through the Ministry of Environment, Rural Modernization, and Kalinago Upliftment. There is also the collaboration of the Ministry of Blue and Green Economy, Agriculture, National Food Security, the Ministry of Tourism, International Transport, and Maritime Initiatives. The overall, obje the overall objective of the SSLR project is to provide assistance to the Kalinago community to access equitable social protection systems, quality services, and improve sustainable economic opportunities. The success of the project is based on uh, four key outputs, which include one, agriculture, boost agricultural production and sustainable agricultural practices. Two, forestry, design and implement community reforestation programs to protect livelihoods and augment critical water catchment areas. Three, tourism, to develop a comprehensive Kalinago tourism strategy and brand that generates new income opportunities for the territory. And four, institutional strengthening to boost institu institutional capacities of the Kalinago Council for improving participative and inclusive decision making and planning. There are several activities on the, each of these outputs, but in the interest of time, we'll focus on one activity which falls on the output four, which brings us here today, which is uh, the webinar. So the SSLR project team, along with the Ministry of Kalinago Upliftment, has noted the importance of creating a wider debate to raise public awareness of Kalinago heritage and the Kalinago heritage's impact on Dominica and the island's future as the first climate resilient country in the world. Now this evening's webinar is the second in the series of four webinars. As the Honorable Minister explained last evening, uh, featured historians and academics. This evening we featured the youth. Uh, next week, Thursday, the 31st of March, and the Friday, the 1st of April, will feature the cultural activists and elders and women, respectively. So these webinars are also aimed at providing information for the production of uh, two Kalinago booklets targeted at school children. One is a coloring book targeting five to eight-year-olds and a uh, comic book targeting nine to 11-year-olds. These booklets represent another initiative on the output four, as mentioned earlier. So um, it was very interesting development here in the territory in terms of the, 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 the process, the activities um, initiated under the webinar uh, project. So let me just now give you the, the bio data or brief really on each of the panelists. We'll kick off with the chief. Chief Lorenzo Sanford was born in 1996 in the community of Bataka in the Kalinago territory. He attended the Castlebrook Secondary School and later the Dominica State College until 2017. Chief Sanford is a, a, a frequent church go and servant of the youth organization in the men's ministry of the Catholic Church. He is deeply com community oriented and values the rights of indigenous peoples, the rights of children and protection and conservation of the environment. Chief Sanford particularly loves farming and spends most of his free time in the garden. He currently serves as chief of the Kalinago territory in the Commonwealth of Dominica. Mr. Ferdison Valmo. Ferdison Valmo comes from the village of Sinecu in the Kalinago Territory. He is the president of the Kalinago Inspirators Youth Group, vice president of the Eastern District Youth Council, indigenous representative to the Ubuntu United Nations and UNESCO. Mr. Valmo is a climate change activist 
He believes that Kalinago youth have the potential to combat climate change while fighting to conserve and protect the Kalinago culture. Miss uh, Alexia Jemina Burton. Alexia Jemina Burton was born on the 21st of January, 1990. She resides in the hamlet of Crayfish River in the Kalinago territory. She received her early education from the Sinico Primary School and then went on, went on to graduate and earn her high school diploma from the Castle Blue Secondary School in 2005. At the tender age of nine, she won the first ever Princess Natari pageant organized by the Carino Cultural Group. Upon her victory, she decided to join the Carifuna Cultural Group. She quickly became involved in the preservation of Kalinago arts and culture. In her adolescence, she was a traditional dancer and regionally and internationally, um, she was a traditional dancer, choreographer, artist, and actress who represented Kalinago culture regionally and internationally, even appearing in the popular Pirates of the Caribbean franchise. Miss Burton discovered her love and passion for teaching at quite a young age and returned to teach at her alma mater, the Sinecook Government School, a primary school, where she worked wholeheartedly for the last 11 years. In 2021, Ms. Burton completed her teacher's training program and degree in education at the Dominica State College, becoming one of the most qualified teachers in her community. She is currently vice president of the Carifuna Cultural Group, where she has taken the new generation of Carifuna members on her wings. Ms. Burton is also the proud mother of two sons. She intends, or she is indeed a super mom, and without doubt, one of the most outstanding women in the Kalinago territory. And then our final panelist, Mr. Devon Coffey. Um, Devon Coffey is a hardworking young man and worked at the Sinico Primary School for the past two years as a mentor to the grade six class. However, his talents are not limited to the classroom. Taking the role of sports coach teacher at the start of the 2021 school year, he led the Sinecu Primary School to claim multiple titles in both the boys and girls categories. In October 2020, with three of his friends, he started the For Kalinago Outreach Program. Mr. Coffey decided to join, and the group provided care packages to over 10 elderly members from the Kalinago territory, an endeavor which led him being voted the most inspiring Kalinago male youth of the year in 2020. In 2022, Mr. Coffey was recruited as a United Nations volunteer through the UNDP Dominica Projects Office. He also seized the opportunity to become part of the Kalinago Council very recently, an undertaking which was successful and he's currently the youngest member of the Council. So there you have it, um, some background as to our panelists. Of course, the, 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 the chair of the panel needs no introduction. Uh, historian, academic, sportsman, musician, uh, historian, um, degree qualified at the postgraduate level um, in history and political science. So it is a pleasure to uh, pass you on to the Honorable Minister Frederick to proceed with the panel discussion. Thank you very much, Washla. Thank you for that, that, that very, very, very wonderful and warm and encouraging an introduction of our Kalinago briefs up front here. Um, so the, the, the format of this evening is, is very simple. Each of the presenters will we, we'll, we'll speak to, to a question. And, um, and in, in, the, in, the, in the break between these questions, we will we'll seek to answer questions coming in via the, the virtual means and otherwise. And so we are looking at four main issues this evening for the listening public. Uh, we are, we'll look at the how. We'll look at how the Kalinago heritage has has, has helped to shape the Whitey Kubulian society. So if you notice, I was taken of Dominica. It's on now Whitey Kubuli. And um, so that's one piece. How has it done that? And the second piece is, is how do we treat aspects of the heritage and how do they affect the future? So we'll look at the impact of that heritage on the future of the Kanago people. And the, the, the third piece, we want the, the moderators the, and the, sorry, the, the, the panelists here will, will give you a few takeaway um, points that are very, very in, embedded in Kanago heritage. 
and so it's sort of eye opener they will bring out to you and also we we will get from them a number of ideas and suggestions as to how we can continue to to protect and preserve the cultural heritage of our people and to say they are part of a, a big movement this evening they are part of of retelling the narrative of the Kailago. so that's the mission here tonight and so we know that the history is normally written by the conquerors and and so we we, we would have have gotten and accepted to some extent education systems, religious systems, systems of governance. But it's important that we look within and also harness the, the importance of our own heritage. And, and so tonight we are going to get a youth perspective on heritage, a youth perspective on how that heritage has affected the Carago community and also the wider white Ecuadorian society. I, I, I will go in order of, of, of the sitting here. So Chief, uh, Chief Lorenzo, then Devon, and, and Ferdinand, and then um, Alex here. And each of you will treat and, and, and add some value to each of the questions. So the first question, first question, how has the Carinago heritage and traditions helped shape Dominica or helped shape white Ecuadorian? And, and what are the most important contributions um, of the Carinago to White Kubuli's progress. So Chief, you, you, have, you have the floor, and I just want you to, um, to spend some time to, to, to express your views on how the Kainog heritage and traditions has helped to shape our White Kubulian society. Chief? Okay, Mabrika, good night to the listening public, to the Emo News listeners, TBS Radio, JS itself, and the members who are here tonight, um, minister, the moderator himself, and the youth who are sitting here with us. Um, I would just like to say, not before entering the question itself, um, that the Sustainable Livelihoods and Resilient Project is very wide. And what I commend them is in that they have reached to the various different stages of, of life within the Kalinago space with the elders, the youth, um, what I would consider lower than youth, the youthlets. So they have been reaching out to, to them and I think we, with reaching out to, to this part of the, of the Kalinago life, they have started from the foundation itself in, in setting things or reaching out in, and letting them put things in place starting from the foundation up. Now, the, to the question, I think we need to take two things in mind. Um, firstly, is that up to a few decades ago, Kalinagos were still marginalized and had, I would say, limited opportun opportunities to, pass it, to participate in the white Kubuli society. Um, secondly, despite of this marginalization, Kalinago culture and heritage have become an integral part of the white Ukubuli Creole culture. One of our most important aspects to the lives of the ancestors was living in harmony with nature and making sustainable use of the available resources that were provided. Because of that respect to Mother Earth, the warrior ancestor spirits defend their domin this white Ukubuli itself from the colonizations after many other islands have been established as plantation colonies using slave labor. Um, now, for this reason, white Ukubuli still can be considered pristine and be referred to as the nature isle. Um, now, over the past years, the widespread use of Kalinago canoes, especially before the great advent of the onboard motors and fiberglass boats themselves, played a part in the sustainable part of local fishing for with the Kalinago people. Now, even to this present day, Kalinago fishers are responsible for a significant amount of fish that come in for our landing sites within the Dominica or the Kalinago space and the wider Dominica itself. So I must say kudos to that. Um, also, Kalinagos are well known for their very good at sustainable use of the land itself within the Kalinago space. And 
our forest resources that are, that are available to us. Now, this, the extensive knowledge and use of these wild domestic plants that we have within our space that we use for food. And what I must say is that many of those plants that we use for, for the foods, for, for foods, we also use them as our traditional medicines. And we, we all as Kalinagos and Dominica can attest to that. Um, I think our traditional extended families structure in respect to our elders have maintained an even better and safer community for the families itself and the Dominican town public. So I think I shall stop here for now. Um, let Mr. Coffey continue. Thank you so much, Steve. Before we go into Devon, I just want to recap very briefly. Um, in, uh, in looking at how Kalinago traditions have helped shape Dominica, Chief spoke to, 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 all, to the fact that although being, we are still marginalized to some extent, or was for some time, um, we have become in, an integral part of the Creole, Creole culture. Now this, that is very important, because it's a fact that um, Creole culture leans on 18th century European, African, and Kalinago culture. And so names for villages, um, the names for plants and animals are, are Kalinago in Creole. So if you take off the Kalinago piece on the Creole language itself, it, it loses it lose a lot of value. So that's a key piece. And, and here's an example of, of how we could localize it. Just imagine you go to the, to the seaside or the riverside to cook a pot, to bubble a pot as we say it. So you do three stones and you put your pot. The Kalinago is one of those stones. So if we take off the Kalinago bus, there's no pot. Basically, that's what it is, because it has it is in actual protected by law. And canoe building, important point here. Canoe building is key, and also the fisher folk. Um, um, and so, and so, it was a wise use of the forest resources to do canoe building. So, chief, you one point here. And and last but not least, the land use, important, because land it is very scarce in 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 in, in the archipelago. And so it's important to look at this and look at domestication of, of plants and, and even use, usage of wild plants. So I want to thank you that for that, Chief. And let's um, um, hand the, 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 the floor over to, to Devon. How has the Kayanago heritage and tradition helped to shape Waitikubuli? Well, let me just start by saying good night to everyone listening via the different media outlets. And to add to what Mr. Frederick and Mr. Sanford said, we all know the different names of the places and plants and animals that stem from the Kalnago language. But I must say the most important contribution from the Kalnago to the development of Dominica has been in the tourism and agricultural sector and the economic sector in Dominica. We, first, we see this firsthand whenever Dominica is marketed to the outside world, the cuisine, the culture, features, and lifestyles of the Kalnago people are used to appeal to a niche market where people who visit Dominica come because we have a Kalnago community in Dominica. And however, these economic benefits don't always trickle down to the Kalnago people. And also, to speak to the agricultural aspect, the Kalnago farmers and individuals, past and present, have made tremendous contribution to the agricultural sector. Although agriculture in the Kalnago territory is not what it has been in years past, we still have hawksters and exporters coming through the territory to purchase our agricultural produce almost every day. Um, sorry. I guess we're... So the Kalago people have to offer a lot of things in the development of Dominica. Another thing is that the Kalnago people has also contributed in keeping Dominica on the front burner of international organization discussions. By, because we have certain rights which were outlined by United Nations and UNESCO and other organizations that look out for minority groups around the world, like the Kalnago people. In doing this, it keeps a shining light on Dominica. It is true they may be looking at the Kalnago people as a minority group, but the entire country benefits whenever anything comes in for the Kalnago people. And in this way, the Kalnago have become a catalyst in which stimulate the economic growth in Dominica, by virtue of us being the Kalinago. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Devon. Thank you, Devon, for this, this sweet, very sweet and, and, and exciting contribution. 
And to say, just to, 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 before I bring in Felice in that, the tourism piece is important. You mentioned it here, and marketing is important. And if you tie it to the last piece that you mentioned, and talking about be, it being sort of the catalyst for, for, for change, and, and it, it brings to the fore the importance within the circles of the international community is important. And so, yes, there, there, there are rights on the United Nations. There's the UN DRIPS, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. It, it was ratified by Dominica in 2007. Aspects of that ratification have not been entrenched in law, but I've argued many times that the, the various trappings within the Constitution of Dominica itself addresses some of these issues. And so it's important to understand that um, there's some sensitivity by international agencies and organizations toward the Kanago people. And, and so we are on the sort of the, the front burner of the marketing tools for, for, for the, for the white Kubuli. Agriculture is important, like you said, and although the, the, some, of, some of the habits have changed, um, we, we see that it's, it's also very, very important in driving the economy. Because even as we speak, we, we do have a, a sort of subsistent form of agriculture, and, um, and we have people en, 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 enrolled and engaged in small tourism activities. I'm so very excited for this, the catalyst. I, I think this is a key word I'll carry off from this conversation tonight that the kind of people can be the catalyst for change and for drawing attention to the country, um, especially related to international organizations. For this, I hope you're ready for this. You, you filled man up. Um, um, how, um, how has the heritage, the traditions of our ancestors, and even what we do today, helped to shape Do Dominica? Good evening to everyone and those listening from the various media platforms. So my answer to the question would be, Two main two um, two things the Kalnago people mainly contributed to would be the agricultural sector, like my fellow panelist Lizara just going to say, and the tourism sector. So, in terms of the agricultural sector, we see the cultivation and production of the um, how would I say the traditional foods such as the cassava, the bananas, and we don't only see that the cultures or the beliefs that falls within that small box, the agricultural sector, it's not only found within the Kalnago territory, it's found way out. For example, would be the way the Kalnago people look at the, the moon for planting of the different agricultural crops. We don't only see Kalnago people practicing that particular belief. We see it all over Dominica, and not only for one specific crops. We also see the, the production of more than one crop that is found here in the Kalnago territory. For example, we are not, only, we are not the only one um, producing cassava, which is, I would say, the main thing that we depend on currently. <laughs> and secondly, the tourism sector. Um, first of all, we see that the, um, the Kalnago territory faces receive like let me, let me give an estimated number. Well, let's say from 100 to 500 visitors in the season, and we would say that this is the most visited area here in Dominica. It's one of the main places people choose to visit, and I would say that we, the Kalnago territory, generate as much income and contribute this much income to the economy. And thirdly. I would like to say that the other contribution that we have made is being resilient. That's the main word here tonight, resilient. It's not, we the Kalnago people are very resilient from fighting off colonization and to still being here trying to preserve the culture that we have. So tonight I'm just going to make it short and I'm going to move on to the next panelist tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much for this and for that. The, the agricultural piece again, you see there's a common thread in the conversation. The Kalago piece is important and you made a very salient point, which I cut, cut off that conversation, the moon phases. It, it's not by chance that people do um, plant by the phases of the moon. There's a lot of science that says that the, the phases of the moon controls and, and uh, the, the, the tides and, and, and water systems and ecosystems, so it is important that we look at this here. And it's something that has adopted across the country. So definitely, it has helped to shape the agricultural sector within our country. 
And what is also interesting in that conversation is the fact that um, the sort of what you call the Jade Kwaib or the Karnago Garden is, is what we talk about now as, as diversifying our, our, our planting habits. And so the monocrop culture is not one that we, we always did in that space was one that leaned heavily on a mixture of crops. I gave this story last week on, on, on the show, uh, last week, that, um, that um, the Kanago people grew a lot more ground provisions than anything else. And it is tipped heavily in, 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 in some myth and legend. The legend is very simple. At the beginning of time, the Lascali call a massive boa constrictor crawled out of the sea and, and, and came in on, 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 the, on the land. And in its wake, it left a, stair, a staircase in, in Sineku. And it went in deep into the forest. And Kainago Braves went into the forest looking for this wonderful, magnificent creature and smoked him out of his cave using tobacco on a paddle. And when he came out of the cave, um, he asked, what do you want? And they said to him, we, we need, we need to, to grow food. And, and he, he vomits out stuff. And this stuff goes in all corners, in cracks, in crevices. And so all, all of the crevices are filled and we have, we have the yams, the tanias, the dashin. And the crawling part where it goes through becomes the, the, the cucumbers and the, and, the, and the potatoes and all of those things. So, and we realize the last point that Ferguson said is important, the resilience. And you can, you can realize that after a hurricane, a hurricane like Maria, when all of the crops on the top of the soil is washed off or blown off, the root crops, the cassava, the tanias, the dashin remain. So we could say, without a doubt, for this and that in terms of agriculture, we have, we, have, we have really contributed that to the Dominican or the white Cuban society. Thank you. Thank you so much. So the only woman in the house, powerful woman, of mother of two, <laughs> trained education personnel. So Lexi, you are, you are, I call her Lexi for tonight. You have the floor, Lexi, and to answer and bring some value to how is it that the current agriculture and traditions have helped to really shape what we now know as Waiti Kubuli or Dominican culture. Lexi. Honorable Frederick, Chief Lorenzo Sanford, Mr. Gregory Rabes, organizers, listeners, and viewers, a pleasant evening to you all. Okay, so the Kalinago people came to the Caribbean as a free people out of curiosity in search of new lands for farming and hunting. So therefore, our ancestors were able to take with them many useful plants and animals. Some of the crops brought included cassava, sweet potatoes, and corn. Some of our fishing and hunting techniques were also brought with them. They also brought it with them. And these are some of the techniques that we actually use today still. And even some of the ways that we prepare our food, our cuisine, um, today, this is um, an important part of our local cuisine and our diet. The Kalinago people were also a very resourceful group of people. We use nature to provide and keep our bodies healthy and strong. The herbs were used for medicinal purposes. And I believe that today, in addition, things like the conch shells, our drums, were used to send signals and warnings and are still being used today. Everyone knows what time it is when you hear the conch shell. We know that fish is coming, fish is on the way. Also, the drums, our lapo cabwit, play a very pivotal role in our carnival celebrations. I mean, what would carnival be without our lapo cabwit? Also, our Kalinago people made a very important contribution when they brought um, our local plants and animals with them on their journey. Because right now, we, can, we are very proud of our national flag. And we, if it wasn't for the Kalinago people, we would not have the Cicero Parrot on island. So I, I think um, our, our national flag is our pride and joy, and we are thankful that we brought along our Cicero, our treasured Cicero parrot. Okay, so with all that said, what I said, and also the contribution made by the other panelists, we can definitely say that the, that the Kalinago people have made a major influence, um, has made a major influence on the island, 
And today we still continue to make valuable contributions to our homeland as we strive to move forward as a people. Thank you very much, Lexi, for this, this, this wonderful contribution here. I think your own point, I, just, I wrote down Cicero when you, just after, you, before you said Cicero. And it's important, yeah. So, <clears throat> Lexi speaks about the new lands, and, and that's important because we, we, our modern land is actually the southern continent, which is referred to in present time as South America. I really want to figure out how that got named. No one ask anybody on the southern land what they call the land, and we call it South America. And they, or they want to know if we call it North America because some, some um, explorer called Amerigo or somebody saw it first. Um, but although there were people on the land living there already. He didn't ask the name. He just said, well, it's North and South America. And we accept it, and we seem to be very happy about it. But tonight we will help to change that narrative because um, we can unearth those names by doing the proper research. So the new land is important. So the, the archipelago and white people is, is, is new land. An important point, like you made there, the kind of people bringing across with them their, 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 most, their most needed um, um, herbs and plants and animals. And one of those that also came out of the, 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 what you know as the Amazon basin is the laumarid. The laumarid came and we brought us plants and we would plant it around the periphery of the, the, the rainforest. Because you know, Dominica have seven different um, 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 vegetational types. And so the rainforest would be the places where we plant the lauma, and we can now create all of the master, the masterful pieces of that. And the Cicero, rightly so, proud Cicero. And even when you look at some of the, 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 the pirate movies, and all those with buccaneers, you see um, the sailors with a, with, a, with a Cicero on their shoulder. That wasn't their thing, you know, that was our thing. They saw that, they got jalo of it, and they did it. And so every time you see a, a, a parrot on a, on a on a, on a pirate's shoulder is what we did. That's what we did. So, so Lexi is so right. They sort of took it from us, but we, we're writing the story over. So we will, I, I will get one soon. I'll wait on my, my shoulder when I go to Roseau on a Saturday morning in the market. And to say, the, the conch shell is important, the drum is important. It's also help with communication, and that is key. And so Lexi, I think um, all of you here, Chief, um, Devon, and Ferdison, and, and, and Lexi have added some value to to explain already how, how we have um, um, helped to shape that by providing information on agriculture, on, on tourism, on the arts, on craft, on food pre preservation and preparation. And last night I spoke about the, 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 the boucané, which is the barbecue, which is a Kalinago thing. So whenever you, you, I'll say tonight again, whenever you eat a, a piece of barbecue, you're eating, actually eating a, 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 a food, um, preparation technique um, done by the Kayanago and, and, and our ancestors. So thank you guys for this section here. I want to go into, briefly go into the, into the other part of our, our, our questions here. I also have the kind of line open for questioning. Uh, anybody want to share questions in the audience? You can share it on the, on the, on the live feed and we will, we will make an attempt to, to answer those. The second question is, what, 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 what is the impact? So we know we, it, has, it has happened. So what is the impact of the Kayanago heritage on the future? How do we see all of those things? Because it is important to, to use the knowledge of the past to inform the future. So Chief, how, how, do, we, how do we see the impact of, of the Kayanago heritage on the future? And, um, and especially as it relates to Dominica um, becoming the first climate resilient country. Um, let me start by saying um, we have we have survived survived conquest, we have survived colonialism, genocide, and it is an important aspect of or a segment of the white Kubuli society, and contributing significantly to our national development itself. And for example, this had made us the Kalinagos as a resilient people. Um, now, the Kalinago people, I must say, have, are prepared to make a very valid contribution in the aspect of national development. Um, our, my, my counselor here, Mr. Devon, mentioned it earlier, the promotion of the tourism, the ecotourism destination, and I think it is, it is very much important. Now, our heritage and lifestyle I think it is an ideal for 
the what is being brought out through the SSLR project, which is the community building of the community tourism itself. So I must say it, it is very important for that. I, uh, our craft items, I mean, it can be diversified and enhanced to appeal to the wider market itself, not only to the, to the national level, the Caribbean itself, even nationally. So I must say this part of it is very important. For the cultural groups themselves, they have provided the traditional songs. Mr. Greg Rabes can attest to that. The, the traditional songs, our dances, the myths and legends itself. Um, I think all of that can, can also add value to enhance the, the tourism product that we sell as Kalinago, that we sell as, as Dominica itself. Um, secondly, I know the Kalinago people have traditionally been involved in the small scale agro processing we, within their homes um, as the, as for home consumption and I mean, for the, the, the small family itself. Now, over the years, we have experienced and gained and resulted in improved of these, these products that we have added value to it, I must say. So we must say thank you to that. Um, I think we need to equip ourselves with better processing equipments. Um, I think through these products can be made. We have our cassava, which is a very resilient, pro re resilient crop. We can move into the ca cassava flower itself and produce it while scage. I mean, we are Kalinagos. We started it off. So um, also what I, well, the, the, the third thing of it, um, the Kalinago territory has a potential to become a major center for the traditional arts, the culture within the Caribbean region. We, the Kalinago people, are the only ones in the, the indigenous people, I would say, within Dominica, within the entire Caribbean itself. So thanks to that, our youths, they are much skillful and, and, and talented. And the thing with us, we are easy to train. We, we, we can we can get it done. Besides the craft building and traditional songs, the dances, there are the concepts that can be developed and you know, develop into producing various aspects of our our heritage. Um, uh, I think I shall hold on for there. Let's let the other panelists go. On. <laughs> thank you, Chief. Thank you, Chief. Uh, in a, in a nutshell, we, we you, I, I, from you, Chief, I realize that um, we're saying that the, the impact is very high. It's a very high impact for the future because we're looking at um, the ecotourism destination by the essence of how we live our lives, how we take care of nature, mother earth. We, we have added some serious value to 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 dump, to Whitey Gubuli as an eco ecotourism destination and to look at the arts and craft, etc. But a, 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 a key point you made here, Chief, in moving forward toward the future is the fact that you spoke to agro-processing and, and it, appears, it appears to be a, a, a big scientific and a sort of a modern movement but, but you're right Chief, this is a movement that started within the Kalago heritage so, so my grandmother and, and her, her mother before her and her mother before her and her mother before her would do agro-processing at their homes they would have take, taken the, the pepper and, and pong it in, in a in mortar and pestle put it in a bottle, add some sea salt and you create a pepper sauce. So all of the pepper sauce you, we, we have around um, in, in the Caribbean, in Dominica, this is from the Canago heritage. We had wild tomatoes. We crushed the tomatoes up, put it in a jar, and, and in, in a calabash, and kept it there for, for a couple of weeks, and that was the ketchup. And so all of those things people do normally, and the normal um, white tikubuli and out of the Canago territory use it's our stuff. And so agro-processing was key, a key part of our, of our, of our livelihoods because it, it is a no-brainer. It is really just a logical reason. We, do not have, we don't have any refrigerators. We don't have anything to freeze our food. So we find ways to preserve it. And by, and by doing so, we have to have a sort of processing that happens. And so we see, we do this, we, we see this very same thing, Chief, for, for cassava production, etc. But um, I'm to say that the traditional arts is important, and, um, and um, so we have jams, we have pima, the, 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 the pepper sauce, and we also have uh, a mental, uh, a human, the human capacity chief, 
uh, as you spoke to, how easy it is for, for Karinago to learn new skills. So I'm very, very hopeful for the future that Karinago will, will be able to, to bring a lot of value to the, the future society because we're easy, we can easily adapt and, and add value to, 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 to the, the white equivalent landscape. Devon, um, I hope you're ready for this this year. Um, um, what, what is it? What is the impact and, 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 uh, of the future? We, we, I, I, I studied the past and I, I love the past, but I, I want us to use the past to inform how we deal with the future. And, and that's a key point here. So if you just add some value to it, that, that would be awesome. Yeah, well, as you said, the past, you know, we cannot go to the future if we don't know our past, we don't know where we're heading. And I must say that without a doubt in my mind that the Kalanago people are one of, if not the most resilient people in the world. And I say that because we have been here for centuries, even thousands of years. Where have we seen other indigenous tribes fade away and vanish off the face of the earth, leaving behind only fragments and pieces of their culture? Whilst here in Dominica, we the Kalinago have proven that we are resilient in keeping our culture alive, but also in our health and housing stock. And these are two areas in which the Kalinago have proven to be very resilient. And if we were to advance or desire to become the first climate resilient country, we definitely need to look at the Kalinago people and try to create a marriage of the traditional and modern housing techniques if we are to maintain our uniqueness as a Kalinago people. And the knowledge that we need to build resilience. And as it relates to health, the Kalinago people has a wealth of knowledge and we know that the health and wellness industry nowadays is a billion dollar industry. And we are not tapping into it fully. However, in the future, if we could collect that knowledge from the Kalinago people and market it properly, we could build an economic stable stability for the Kalinago territory. And to add to that with the cosmetology, cosmetology market as well, another billion dollar industry one which has been growing in the territory. For example, let's take hair. People spend hundreds of dollars on hair a year, right? Whereas all women have natural, beautiful hair. That is treated with natural products such as coconut oil, castor oil, hibiscus, and balier do, all other stuff, right? And if we can market them properly, the future looks bright for the Kalinago people. But however, there has to be measures put in place to safeguard the secrets and the treasures of the Kalinago people, and not just exploit them like the other indigenous people have in the past. And I think if we hone in on these two fa facets of the Kalinago people and our culture, we can create a massive economic boom in the Kalinago territory. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Devon. I think the resilient piece again is important because um, when you look at archeological information, we realize that uh, about 4,000 years before the common era, or what do you say, before Christ, the year zero. Uh, at least 4,000 years, people, our Kalinago people were hunting and gathering all across the, 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 the archipelago. And, and about 200 years before the common era, before the year zero, um, the people settled down in communities and started doing the farming and, and the arts and craft and doing pottery. So, so you could see we have a very, very long history. And even during the, the, the colonization period, we fought metal, we fought steel, we fought guns, we fought, we fought swords, we survived germs, um, all, all sorts of sicknesses we survived. And, and so we're here today, not by chance, but we are here because our, our, in, our, in our own lives we are able to resist all of those trappings of, of invasions. And you made a very important point, marrying the tradition and, 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 and the modern techniques. And I just want to give the listening public a one, a, 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 a one example of, of, of that movement. The kayak. The kayak is, is, a, is a vessel, a sea craft, and a, and a lake craft that is built by the Inuit. What we know, what we knew in the past to call the Eskimos. The Inuit people made, made a, a, a vessel called a kayak. And the word kayak actually means a man's boat. So one man's boat. And the kayak was made out of, out of wood and or, out of bones of animals and covered with skin. Now, as we speak, a kayak can be found on any beach or any river anywhere in the world. It is not made out of skin and, and sticks and, 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 and skins. Some of them are made out of, out of plastic. 
Some of them are made out of, of, of uh, aluminum. Some of them are made, made out of all types of material. But the fundamental thing that remained in the kayak, it kept the original traditional design, and it, it still has the original traditional function. So in that very same way, I want to start that conversation moving forward in, in terms of how do we marry our, our modern architecture and designs and materials with with a tradition. What if we have a cabin like this? It's all, and the entire roof is, is, is solar panel or glass. What do we have the beams here in reinforced concrete? But it sticks to the tradition while we use modern material. So you want point Devon, I think these are some of the things we can add to the future of Dominica as we move forward. Um, Ferdison, let's jump in here. Let's, let's add some value to that conversation. So in response to question two, it's often said that it's bad to hang on to the past. But we all know that we live in a world of uh, developing materials, technology. And I think many people believe that it would be hard for the Kalanago people to really hang on to the tradition or that heritage, as we would say. And I believe that the impact we would have on the future, looking at the future, so let's just move on to one word, future. So it is evolving. And I think that we, we've um, the, uh, the network already spreading out within Dominica based on the culture that we share with those living in Dominica. It would simply say that we can really have that impact on the future. So it's all about, as Mr. Frederick um, recently said, that, for example, the Kabi, the example about the Kabi. So why not hang on to that specific knowledge? So why would we want to give up a knowledge that we know we can adapt to? Because I strongly believe that the Kalanau people uh, have the capability to adapt to different environments. So currently, we can really see that in this year, 2022. So yeah, my answer would be short tonight. So thank you. Ferdison, Ferdison thank you. Adaptation, I think, is key here. Because um, you re realize that before the European scheme, we were living in a, in a time of abundance. My walk around, you know, so you can just get a few goggles, eat that, and go to the fish, in the sea, get some fish. Well, once the European came in, they start um, putting in our minds that we should, we should take those things and make some profit out of it. So, so, so we have adapted to that. But you're right about how do we transcend that into technology, and it's important. I just want to go back to Devon briefly. Devon spoke about the health and medicine, and that's important. And he spoke about cosmetics. Do you know for a fact that there, there, is, there is a plant in the Kainago space called the Ruku? It's, it's red and you can put it into uh, season your meat and stuff like that. And the Kainago people actually paint their bodies with the Ruku. Why? In some cases in the tropical countries you have insects and, for example, mosquitoes. And so that, that covering over the body protected the, the ancestors against the mosquitoes. So all of these are things we could add. So when we see people put stuff on their face, it's put against the sun and all that kind of stuff, uh, it's never linked at all to what we did as the indigenous people. So we could, also, we could almost certainly say that cosmetics and, and the covering of the skin for protection against the element came out of that heritage. And, and even while people do it haphazardly for other purposes, I think it's important to cement it as an important part of the cultural heritage. Like, see, I suspect you might want to speak more about the cosmetics and, and move in the future. But so, so you have the floor. <laughs> not really. I'm not really into cosmetics. Natural beauty. <laughs> okay, so um, I cannot stress on this more because everybody touched on it that our Kalinago people are actually the most resilient people there are and they are able to adapt and that is something we admire we're able to adapt to our environment so when we came when we came to dominica we settled all over dominica it was ours but after colonization we were pushed and pushed and pushed further around the island until eventually we had to run to the East Coast, which is the most rugged part of Kalinago territory, for safety. 
Now, it so happened that this part of, the, this part of Dominica, the island, is actually the most safe part in Dominica. We are in the green zone. So I'm very much involved in sports. So I am thinking that we are here in a, the safest spot in Dominica. In case of a volcanic eruption, what are we going to do? Are we prepared to house the rest of Dominica? What is going to happen? So a few years ago, I was at a discussion, and this topic came up about having a mini stadium at the Jolly John Park where you build, it, you build it in such a way that it can actually house a lot of people. So in case of an emergency or an eruption, that we can house them. At the same time, this mini stadium can also be used for sporting activities. And we can also encourage tourism sports. As we know, Kalinago people are naturally talented athletes. We have the raw talent here. I have seen athletes who have never trained, and they went to run long distances and actually place in the top with absolutely no training. And we also have proof of that because we have many national cricketers. Um, we even have a national woman um, footballer presently. We have had national men and women volleyballers. So we have a, not, a lot of natural talent here when it comes to sports. And Kalinog people are... I would say they, they're just naturally competitive. Whatever we are introduced to, we always want to be the best at it. So why not introduce or help develop a mini stadium to be able to house our other Dominican friends as well as benefit from it by sports, through sports tourism? Thank, thank you very much, Lexi, for, for this input. Just to wrap up with your, your points here this evening, I think the common thread for the, this particular part of the, of the conversation lean heavily on resilience and adaptation to the environment. And you mentioned the, the green zone, which is, which is really true. When we did the scientific data analysis, we realized that we are, we are, we are further away from the, 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 all of the, most of the nine volcanoes across the island. And, and to say, in case of disaster, we, we are in a safe space. And so it's not by chance, really. So you could see that the, the Karnago ancestor had some foresight to figure that the, maybe the safest place to run to would be that. And when you look at the geological data too, we realize that when, when, when White Tigu came out of the ocean about 23 or 24 million years ago, um, the first part of, of the island to rise out of the water was that space, the general northeast space. So when you look at the ge geological data, you do this, the soil testing, the rock testing, it is the oldest part of the country. And, and so it adds some value to that, to, to how do we treat that moving forward and how do we create sa a safe haven in case of disasters across the country. And um, the raw talent is an important point. We have added that already in the present time. And I, can, I could see many more of these um, coming, to, coming to, to fruition in, in the coming years as we develop our, our wonderful white chicken bully. So, um, so panelists, Chief Devon, Felice, and uh, Lexi, we want to leave a few things with, with, with our listening audience. We want to leave with uh, three or four things that, that they should take away um, and as, it, as it regards the importance of the Kalago heritage. What is it that we want our listeners to really to hold on to and to understand and to appreciate as we, as we talk about, and, and you see how we have it here? Their Kalinago heritage. It's important to note, because I've argued many times, just by us being on this island for a number of years, that Dominica, or White Kabuli, is what is Kalinago country. That's it. And no one can contest that. If you go around the country, you, 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 it, from the north, Capuchin, and, and Itasi, and you, you, you go down to um, 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 Kalibishi, you come to Salibia on the east coast, Badaka, the Sari Sari area, you go around to Beriqua, you go around to, to Ruzo, Kairi, you go you back on the west coast, Kolihu, Kulibishri, you go down right down south, Kashaku, all of these are kind of good names. So it means that the entire space, and we, have, we do have archaeological evidence to suggest that we lived in all those places at any one time. And so, there are a few things I want you guys to leave with the listening audience, because um, we, want, we want everyone to appreciate that 
even if you do not have the skin color or you do not live in that space, that you do have some aspects of the Kainago heritage. And what are the s at least four things that you would chief start with you and then Devon and, and, and Felice and Alex here, live with the listening audience? I, I think one of the of the main four things that we should leave with our listening audience is the strong Kalinago heritage and culture, which I think would build pride in a pe in the in the, we the people itself. You no, know, we sh as Kalinago people should be proud of our heritage. You no, know, and this would make us better and much more united. Build, I think it would build a stronger community and have more in 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 the the confidence of the people itself and the abilities and potential um i think it will be make us better prepared to take on different issues as we face them and successfully overcome those challenges in which we can confront them as as we progress as a people uh, the second one our love for freedom. Now, our love for freedom has propelled us, our, us and our ancestors to read the slave plantations and, you know, set, set enslaved, the enslaved Africans free. That, that is a second thing we have to note. Now, this is the same spirit that led us into fighting against those colonial police when they came, which caused the, the 1930s uprising within the Kalinago space. So, you know, because of the interfering with our traditional practices with, the, with, the, with the, our neighboring French islands. And just, just backtracking a bit, Mr. the minister touched on the, on the kayak that we use. Now, now one of the, the most important things we have to note, our French, our French um, neighboring islands, which, which which, which is on our north and south end. They, we, they, they, it, is, it is in the history books of them that they, they took on our, our traditional bois flow, which helped them especially to defeat the enemies that, that were coming on the, on the larger boats. They would use the bois flow because it would help them move into the stealth mode at night that they conquered those ships and, and take them down before they, they attack the, the, the island itself. So that's why we, the Kalinago people, have had a close relationship with the, our French neighboring islands. Um, no, I think this, this has gives us, have given us the, uh, the courage to stand up and fight, not for ourselves, but for other people itself. So that would be the second. Um, the third one I would like to touch on is the the is our our service to others in times of needs in times of a disaster we will ensure the safety and welfare of our neighbors as Kalinago people um, our our educational attainment through the young Kalinago men and women as we also mentioned earlier Miss Alexia Burton she is topping her academics when it comes to the the teaching level within the Kalinago space. So I think this, this have, can contribute significantly to we the Kalinago people and to, to national development itself. Thank you very much, Chief. I think the cultural heritage piece is important on all the issues. And the love for freedom is a, is a, is a, is a really good piece here. I want to leave with the listening public that uh, it's a factor. The, the reason why, the reason why um, people of African descent were brought, brought in as slaves was the fact that the Kanago people enjoyed their freedom and they would not work at all. And they would rather throw themselves off cliffs, commit suicide, rather than working on a plantation. So that is a narrative that even, it, even it, while it is written by the conqueror, the Europeans, it holds true that the people were so in love of the freedom that they would throw themselves off the cliffs rather than working on the plantations. That love for freedom piece is, a, is an important piece to live with all this in audience. And, and also how we use um, um, traditional um, um, crafts, the, the bois flu, the, the rafts, to, to sort of um, 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 uh, use it in the military resistance against that. 
And so it's adopted by other countries, and it'd be very, very important to, 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 to have those, those traditions um, back within the circles of the Kanago space. And the last piece, service to others. The word kudme is to give a hand. It's the French explanation of people working together. That is a Kalinago concept because you would understand that if you're going to build a canoe, you can't do it by yourself with stone axe. You'd have to get people to work with you. If you're going to build a house, you do the same thing, get people to work with you, lend you a hand. If you're going to clear up some forest to plant crops, you can do it by yourself. So the service to others came through the concept of the Kudme. So when we speak about Kudme in Creole language, it is a piece of Kainago heritage. And as a matter of fact, in the 1980s, when, when Mary Junior Charles was the Prime Minister of Dominica, she made it a part of a national service um, calendar by putting that movement on, on 4th of November, the Community Day of Service. And so she used that concept of, of Kudme, service to others, and make it a, a part of our modern heritage. So some important pieces that, that um, Chief, you have added to um, that, that the people can take away from that movement. Um, Devon, just want to roll into that? Yes, well, just to add to what Chief said, I would say our resourcefulness and our adaptability. Because we can see for Kalnago crafts that all basket makers and basket weavers, they can make beautiful and intricate baskets, beautiful design you can decorate your house with. They can make mats, you can the curtains, and even now I see they are making handbags and purses with the Lauma and the Vetive. So I believe our resourcefulness is one of the things I want all Dominicans to be aware of, that the Kalnago people are not someone who will just sit back and lay back and expect things to be done. They have people who will see something and make something out of nothing, whereas other people would sit and cry about their situation, right? And another thing I want to talk about is uh, our health and our, our physical health, like Miss Alexia said. Historically, we have fed on fruits, fish, and, and wild animals which we caught, we would have to hunt down. And that have bred us into being the most, some of the most fit people. I mean, I can attest for myself. I remember a few years back when I was playing football. And for the first 30 minutes, the guy checking, boy, them quiet doesn't stop running. Because we, we could just run. We couldn't play football. I mean, we were not the best, but we, w we would have stamina. We could just run all day. And I think that is something I, w I want the people to be aware of that. We are Kalnago people. They always say we are warrior-like. But I say we just fit. We are built to live in our environment. And another thing I want to say is about not just us, the Kalnago people, but by Dominica Extension. I think, well, right now, it's becoming popular for people to claim the Kalnago lineage, the history, the ancestry. And all of us, I mean, a lot of us have Kalnago ancestry, even though we don't look it. But just looking at the features of the people right now, even though they are darker color and complexion, me, myself, for example, if we trace back our ancestry, we see that somewhere along the line, our grandfather, probably our great-grandmother, somebody in the family tree was a Kalnago and descended from the Kalnago people. So I think that's one thing I want all Dominicans to be aware of. At least try to trace their lineage back as thoroughly as you can to s connect to the Kalnago people because when we do that, we can instill a pride, not just in the Kalnago people, but in Dominica as a whole that we can all be proud to say that, yes, we are Kalnago, not just because I'm from the Kalnago area, I can say we are Kalnago, I can say, but because we are from Whitey Kubuli, we are Kalnago. So even though you go out there, you can proudly say that I am Kalnago when you're representing Whitey Kubuli. Levan, thank you, thank you. I think the resourcefulness piece is important here and the utility of craft and how do we, we spend less money to and, and use local materials to enhance our, the aesthetics of our homes. That's important, I think. And also, like another key piece, uh, important, the health and physics is important. We have a lot of issues now with NCDs, um, the non-communicable diseases that go wrong because we use a lot of processed foods and the natural food and, and water, etc., would have helped us. So it's something that we can, we can live with the, the listening audience that that if you follow some of the eating habits of the Kalinago, you may well save yourself from those sort of um, diseases that you could control. And the, geo the geology piece here, the, the, the sort of ancestry piece is important. If we connect and we find out, if we dig really deep, we'll, we'll find out that there's some connection 
with, 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 uh, with uh, Kalinago, uh, a glorious Kalinago piece. Before I go into Ferguson, um, the, uh, the people on the line, for one person listening to DBS Radio spoke about, um, um, he's still concerned about um, the, the notion that, that cannibalism is still spoken about. And the, 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 the notion that Kalinago people eat. I mean, if you know land that it's, it's, something, it's something really strange. Actually, it has been debunked by, by most historians, by all historians and academics. There's no evidence to suggest that um, the kind of go eat anything. If you live in a land of abundance, you go over and fish and aguti, why you want to eat people? It makes no sense. But the argument would have come out of, out of the, the colonial project because they, they actually found bodies, in some cases, um, buried close to the homes. And, and one, of, one of the arguments we have about having even body parts in the home, just imagine this. We, 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 in 2022, we have a phone, we can take a picture of a family friend, or a family member or friend, and we can keep it on our phone. Before that, we had an album, we stuck a picture in an album. In the glorious past, we had none of these. So ancestor died, I kept the finger of my ancestor so I can remember him. Does that mean I ate my ancestor? No. And so there are many other arguments you can talk about. And there is even the burial rites where, where, where the chief and, and, and the high elders and members of the, of the community would be buried in their hut, in the floor of their hut. And, but, but then with, with no understanding of the tradition of the Kanago people, the European eye converted that into a masterful, masterful um, 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 plot. And so they could get rid of the Kanago people. So, so this is something we can leave with you here. Um, the cannibalism thing have to be this, uh, taken off. And someone is concerned also about the language. What are we doing about the language? Just to tell the listener that we do have some work done. It is progressing work. It is work that, that leans heavily on, on, rec on records from the, from the French missionaries here. And uh, we, we started a, 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 a program on the radio, the word for the day every, every morning, a little bit for seven for the news. And um, so we're doing that bit. And I threw out the challenge last night that we want to encourage someone to take on the science of linguistics, to study and to unearth all of the possibility that, that exists with a language. Because in, in, in anthropology, you understand that um, a people who use a language have really lost a lot of stuff. And so the, the, the colonial project was almost complete because they almost took away everything that really um, pieced piece us together. For this, I want you to go ahead. I don't want to spend too long, but to say to the listening public, and we're happy for the for the the, the questions and and the calls, and it's something that we have to have, and we want you to also play a part in dispelling the sort of myth and legend, and and but also importantly, they are still in the books, in some books. So we have to find a way to get them out, and and to get them out, we have to have people understanding and appreciating the, the rich cultural heritage. For I don't want to take too much of your time. Let's roll. Thank you, Mr. Frederick. Uh, so, in response to question number three, uh, would be what are the four takeaways? So, I'm just, I think I only have just one really thing, meaning related to Kali Nago, would be the knowledge. So, I'm just going to address the listening public. Um, if you have of Kali Nago ancestry, you should be lucky. Um, the Kali Nago people are keen to knowledge, um, the methods of fishing medicine, um, planting, and others, too numerous to mention, as I would say. <laughs> so, um, yes, and three other words I would have would be to be proud. If you found out that you are from, have Kalinago ancestry in your DNA, to be proud of it, to be bold, teach, and Learn. So, yeah, that will be about it. <laughs> Lexi, let's roll into you one time and, and so we can wrap up this, this part. Um, um, some takeaway things I want to leave with the listening audience on, on Kalinago heritage. All right, well, the Kalinago people, as we mentioned before, are a resilient people in all aspects that we can think of. Um, we are very proud people. Remember, we always refuse to be slaves. We'd rather be dead than to be slaves. Um, we love our freedom, as mentioned earlier. Even in the 1930s, we had the Kalinago uprising where we were so used to having our freedom, going to our neighboring islands to buy our goods, to buy our little soppy. 
<laughs> I'll use a Kalina go term there. So to purchase our liquor soapy and we felt that it was so unfair that these like our goods that we went for it was so unfair that it, it, they wanted to take it away from us, those in authority. And we refused. We stood up as a people. And unfortunately, two Kalinago men lost their lives um, that year during that Kalinago uprising. Um, at that time, we had Chief Jolly John, who's actually my great grandfather. Um, he wasn't even present when that happened, when the uprising happened, because when the authorities came, uh, the police came, to seize the goods, the Kalinago people refused to give it up. And we stood our ground, and shots were fired. There was exchange, a, minute, a little battle went on there, and two Kalinago men lost their lives, unfortunately. And the Kalinago chief, who wasn't present at that time, when he came there, he was actually arrested, although he wasn't even present when that happened. So we have been through a lot as a people. We have faced a lot. And... We cannot song that enough for the rest of Dominica. And even today in this present time, we still face some hardships. We still face racism. It's there, and we, we just want to let them know that we have been through enough, and we would just really love it if a lot more appreciation would be shown for the Kalinago people. Because in, I like to refer back to sports, but in sports and in a lot of things, you see it. The, the, the preferential treatment for the non-Kalinagos, especially if you're coming from the country area. We still go through those things. So I just want to song that call, that Dominicans, we have been here, we have made very valuable contributions to Dominica, and we are pleading to you all to show a little more appreciation because we have been there. We, as, as mentioned earlier too, um, when the Maroons were trying to escape, we came to their rescue. So just bear that in mind and remember, even if we are a minority, we have made significant contributions to Dominica. We continue to do so, and we don't like to be treated unfairly, okay? <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, Lexi, for that um, important point. I think you brought in the 1930 war. I'm passionate about this. I, I wrote about this. I think I presented at a couple of conferences. I think you were actually Jolly John, her great grandfather, and, and, and the two men who died. One was my great granddad, and the other one, my great grand uncle. So I'm very passionate about that. Normally I, I cry when I speak about it. But to say that um, the 1940 situation was very, very important because what I want, what I want to, to bring to the audience is um, 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 to, to, so that I can notice the fact that. Um, that uprising actually leans heavily on, on a tradition and something that has adopted in modern times. The free movement of people. The CSME we talk about now in modern times. And, and how we move around CARICOM and, and, and we, can, we can have a skill certificate. All of that is from the Kanago heritage. Because we travel the islands freely with no passport, we exchange goods. We, fi we, find, we find flint, flint tools in Dominica. Dominica has no flint. Most likely, this flint come, came from Antigua. We find, we find um, bulls and, and, and tools that are volcanic in Antigua and in, 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 um, in, 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 in other countries up north, and they don't have volcanic materials. So it means that people are traveling and they're exchanging goods. And in terms of the 1930, interestingly, the Kanaga people moved from, and that's an important point, the trade is an important point that we can add here, that the Kanaga developed trade and something that we, we can do in modern times. It was easier for a Kalinago canoe to, 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 to traverse the ocean, to go to Marigallant or, Ma or Guadeloupe than it was to walk to Rosu. It took my, my great-grandfather three days to go to Rosu and back. One day to walk over the Shimelita through Grand Fall to the Freshwater Lake to Rosu. Another day to do all his shopping and another day to walk back. And he would take his canoe on the Sally Bebe and, and he would be in, in Marigallant in about eight hours. He would do his shopping and come back the following day. And, and to say about the 1930 um, piece here, to remind the listeners here, that that trade was happening. And on, in the historical records, on the 1st of September 1930, was one of the bigger hurricanes that hit the island. So the island was totally devastated by a hurricane in, on September 1st. And by September um, 19th, the police comes to arrest people who are going overseas to get stuff. 
after a massive hurricane. So just imagine um, a military blocking you after Hurricane Maria to get goods from Matnik or Mary Gallant. So that's what happened. And it's something that we have to leave with the public. It's a bigger story. And one of these, um, we, we, and actually, kind of week that we celebrate every September is worked around that particular struggle. It celebrates, it commemorates that struggle. Um, and so this year we will celebrate and commemorate again and we we'll want to invite the, 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 the Dominican white Cuban public to join us in commemorating, commemorating the, the struggles of ancestors uh, who died during the 1950 crisis. We're doing well tonight. We're doing very, very well tonight. I really want to thank you, the guys on the head table. You're doing some really marvelous stuff. And to say to the listening public, the task here tonight is to have points of views that will retell the story. So what we're doing here tonight is, is part of a series of, of, of engagement that will tell the truer story or give a different perspective on the Kanago history. And, and so we are going to look at some of the issues and ideas um, and suggestions that, that, that we, can, we can add that will portray Kanago, Kanago history in a good light. And not only in printed material like a book, um, but also in, in the media, in, in video, and in, in different art forms. So the last piece of our conversation tonight, uh, some of the issues and ideas that you as young folks will, will contribute and you would like to see addressed in the new sort of telling, the new sort of narrative. So when you write the, the, the Dominica story, part two, it will be the White Tiku William story. And it will be informed by your conversation tonight. So, so um, Chief, I want to start with you. What are some of the issues and ideas and suggestions that you, you would like to see part of the new and upcoming narrative on Kalinago heritage? One of the most devastating losses caused by invasion and conquest was the loss of our Kalinago language. Um, it is one of our most important factors in identifying our identity itself as Kalinago. And your language sets you apart as a people, as a unique people. And it is evident that most ways what is left of the Kalinago culture and has, have become part of the Creole culture which is in our white Kubulian society. Um, so I must say this, this fact should lead us to ensure that every aspect of our culture that is left and our heritage that is left, which have survived, must be passed on to our younger generation. Um, not using only the medium that, it, that is available, that we see now, but through the coloring books itself, through the radio, through television programs, even through, through, through video games, I think it, it, can, be, it can be captured and, and be told. The, the Kalinago teachers and education administrators should develop materials which can be integrated into the school curriculum itself. And I think that is, that is a great move that we should move on. I think we should search and listen and must portray our ancestors who really were there, who, who, who can tell the story itself. So it, it has been passed on to us. They are the brave warriors who defend and protected our, our, our land. And I think such literature must be helped. This literature must be helped. Um, they must highlight the efforts of our Kalinago fighting in the slavery and assisting those who, who, were, fort who were fortunate to, enough to, to escape the bondage uh, or of the plantations themselves. Um, in this contribution of Kalinago people, the Dominican culture and, and the national development, or highlight, highlighted there will be a greater awareness and respect for our Kalinago culture and, and heritage. Um, I think this is the great time and the opportunity that, that we need to, to begin this, leg this legacy of Kalinago literature. So I think it will, it will create a better um, positive image for our ancestors and the, the modern Kalinago 
the modern Kalinago. So I think as chief, together as the council, the minister itself, himself, the ministries, the various people involved, we are, I think we are prepared right now and we will support in any way that we can to, to help this endeavor. Chief, Chief, thank you so much. The, the loss of language is important, like we say here. Um, just wrap quickly. The school, the school curriculum is key, and how do we write that, that literature? And also, how do we marry in the resistance efforts that, that tied in with people of African descent? So these are key points we'll come back to. I'll wrap, wrap it up at the end. But Devon, just pitch in here. Um, and and how, how is it? Um, what are some of the issues and ideas that you, you want to suggest uh, as, as it relates to the new, new, the new history? Well, to add to what Chief was saying, I believe the language aspect that really needs to be recovered or retrieved or, what would I say, really uh, disseminated to the public so that we are more aware of our language. We can, could use our language in our local time when we're speaking to each other. And I believe that one way we could do that is to incorporate to the curriculum. And I... Not sure if they're still going ahead with it, but I remember last year they wanted to have a Creole five minutes every day in the primary school for Creole. I believe that would be one of the important or uh, one of the moments we could incorporate our Kalanago language at the young at a young age, so that they grew up speaking the Kalanago language and they are aware of it, and try to incorporate into the high schools as well, and maybe go as far as teaching it as a subject in CXC. You never know. Yeah. All that is to, to the future, but we have to set the stones down now for the foundation for it now. And I also want to say that the documentation of our culture, and not just say orally, because we all know if you're sick and you need to make a bath, you can go by your grandmother, and she'll tell you what to do, and you good. But we need to write it down or actually videotape it so we actually have uh, archive we could go back to and that or or descendants can say okay uh, this we have this situation something maybe we can maybe he's sick maybe we can get a a medicine for me in the archives and we go we look at a little video a little five minute video how to prepare a bath or something for him I think that is one of the things we need to look at as well and also well I remember that the before Hurricane Maria the Carnago people. Uh, was one of the people who had the lowest carbon footprints in the reserve with the solar panel project. And I believe that if it wasn't for Maria, that the Kalanago people, the Kalanago reserve on a whole, could have been fully solar powered by now. And I would like to see that incorporated as well. So, but I think that is the few stuff I would like for, to see going, moving forward for the Kalanago people. Yes, Devon, thank you so much. Briefly, uh, the first sort of five minutes every day is a, is a wonderful idea. How do we get the conversation around the language itself, uh, even at to the point of the high school? Documentation, like you said rightly, is key. And how to capture um, little bits and pieces of the heritage in, in, in sort of um, uh, mini documentaries. And, and so, cast of a processing, uh, how do you, how do, you um, 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 do, do a fishing rod, and, and how do you do a, make a catapult, and how do you. How do you grind some cassava? So that's important. And also, how do we tidy up the literature? Important. And, and the piece you added, which is, which is very, very important for me, as you speak about it as the Minister of Environment, or the fact that we do have a low carbon put footprint, and we're able to, we should be able to, in that space, create more, more to access more of the alternative um, green energy. So I'm excited about those wonderful ideas, Devon. Ferdison, you, you, you want to weigh in here? And I'm um, on to... What are some of the issues and ideas that you have as and suggestions so, so to, to move the, the Kalanago um, story in a different, uh, different angle? Yes, I actually do. So the main issue would be lack of youth involvement. So as you can see, we are speaking on a, as a, at a youth perspective. So in terms of youth involvement, why not get a lot of young people involved in the areas of um, revitalization of the Kalanago language, the agricultural methods, cultural methods, as I would say, the knowledge. So why not create, I mean, I'm giving a suggestion right now. So why not create groups or reach out to certain organizations within the Kalanago territory or Dominica by extension to 
share that knowledge that we have. So let's not look about um, creating videos or writing it down. I think if we wrote it down way back, what would make the difference? What part of that would make or would be an important part in the Kalinago history? I mean, what is Kalinago without our knowledge? So why, why do we want to remove that part of knowledge? Because from if our parents taught us what their parents taught them, don't you think it would be easier for the, the knowledge or the culture to keep spreading from one generation to another? I think, yeah, so that would be um, my response to that question. Thank you. Yes, thank you for this, and I think you've involved me this key. And just to say, I, I sort of um, I'm giving a, 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 a very advanced announcement. Um, during the month of August, I have already planned a, planned a, a youth leadership program. I'm working in collaboration with a university, and I'm so, so before the summer kicks in, you, we will have a chance to register yourself, your interest as a Kanago youth to learn aspects of Kanago heritage and to be able to place you on, in, a, in a better footing in terms of leadership. And so you've been involved in this key here, and we spoke about the language and also the group, group dynamics and cultural transfer is important. And one thing I also want to tell the listening audience too, that there's a, there's a very big difference between heritage and culture. Culture is dynamic, it changes over time, but heritage remains very strong. And, and so culture can change, but the heritage doesn't really change. I some, sometimes I think we mix it up and we, say, we even say cultural heritage. And so sometimes we have to kind of clarify those issues there because it, it helps us to understand things um, um, better. It's almost like oral tradition and oral history. Oral history and oral traditions are two different things. Oral traditions, you, you, you things that you do, you, and then oral histories are the things that you see. And so they, they're sort of quite different. Um, Alexia, you're going you're gonna to end, uh, end this, this uh, segment here. And uh, we've been doing pretty well. But before you go on, Ali Alexia, I just want to say that someone um, asked a question on the, on the email news feed, speaking about the, the, the cassava drink. And yes, we do have a cassava drink. The cassava was fermented, and, and we have a drink called the Wiku. And, and don't laugh, in, in the glorious past, we will we, we'll put some cassava, we we'll grind some cassava and put it into in a massive clay pot. And the women will pass around and, 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 and throw a kwasha man in that, a spit. And so that spit would help ferment the, the cassava to make this wonderful um, uh, wiku. And so there was a lot of love in the alcohol that we had called the wiku at the time because the men would drink it knowing that they would have connected with the women of the village and, and they'd have this wonderful drink. But to say to the, what, what, what is the, 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 the whole, what can we do in modern times with that drink? It's something that the very same way we, we, we export um, the seamers and, and we produce um, the, all of the various types of juices, we, we should be able to preserve the, the, the wiku and make, uh, make it become an integral part uh, as a as sort of a, a, a really grounded, branded kind of good drink. So it's something we're looking at in the entire project itself and, and, and to look at how do we add some value to the existing um, 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 food and, and, and beverage development. Alexi, I, I mean, if you were back in the days, you would have to quash in the, in the pot uh, and to ensure we have a week or so. I want you to lean on that and as you make your contribution. All right, so as um, the fellow, my fellow panelists mentioned earlier, it is really unfortunate and sad that we lost most of our language. I mean, I am happy there are efforts being made to revitalize our language. It would really be nice and interesting if we could actually converse with one another. I admire when Marigot people are able to speak their kokoi and only Marigot people can understand each other. So I wish... We could actually do that as Kalinago people. I mean, we know some simple terms, we know words, but unfortunately we are not able to converse freely and easily um, using our Kalinago language. Okay, um, one of the ways we can deal with that is by, as mentioned earlier, um, introducing more of that to the schools, um, organizing it in a curriculum. Um, but before we can even do that, how many teachers are actually trained in that area? And that is important because a lot of the times we speak about um, getting a curriculum, to, a curriculum together 
um, teaching it in the primary schools, but how many teachers are able to do that? I am aware of certain things because at an early age, I was part of the Carifuna cultural group. So I can say I can handle my end in certain areas, but not all teachers are able to do that. So we may have to have a training for teachers before we can actually even go to the primary schools in, in that area there. Also, um, another way um, Ferdison mentioned that we can target the youth and a way that we can target the youth is making, making at, um, events attractive to the young people. For example, I remember when I was around 17 years, that was in 2007, um, there was a cultural camp at the old Sally Bear School. And it was, I mean, unfortunately, I wasn't able to attend. Um, but from what I heard from my friends, and I mean, I visited there a few days. I was not able to overnight. But some very, very, very interesting programs happened and activities. Um, the young Kalinago children were taught how to make the lauma basket, how to prepare the lauma, the entire process. They, would, they went fishing. They went hunting. They did some of the language, some of the traditional dances. And they even roasted a, a whole pig. And it was very, very, very interesting. Unfortunately, that was the only time that event happened. And if we're talking about getting youth involved, I believe that doing something like that annually, having an annual cultural camp where we get young people and our cultural um, leaders involved, we can move from there. Because... We need to start somewhere with the young people. We need to spark the interest because we are being influenced by social media and so many things out there that a lot of the times our young people are not really interested in those things anymore. So we have to find ways and means to get them involved and get them um, to learn to love and appreciate their culture more. Because if we continue down that path, what is going to happen to us later down in life? What is going to happen to our traditions that we value so much? So we have to start somewhere. We have to start with the grassroots programs. We have to start with the cultural camps. And also, too, I want to call out to the cultural groups in the area. They play a very pivotal role in our culture. And I believe that it is much more than just coming to a stage and dancing. Our culture is a lot more than that. So the cultural groups in the area have a major role to play. So I'm sounding that call to them. I am putting that challenge out there to them. I know we in the Carifuna Cultural Group, we have some really good plans and I'm really looking forward to it. And we're also encouraging young people who are willing to join the cultural groups very interesting. You learn a lot about yourself and you'll be able to more identify as a, yourself as a Kalinago people, uh, as, as, sorry, as a Kalinago person. So join the cultural groups and the cultural groups and the cultural leaders too also in the community like Mr. Honorable Frederick right here. He's a historian. He knows, he has so much up here in his head that we need to find some way to get that out. We need to, we need to get that information and that knowledge. We need them to pass it on to us, the young people, and to educate the young people because there is so much that we do not know. And there is so much that more that we need to learn about ourselves to learn to appreciate what we, what we have and who we are as a people. Yeah, thank you very much, Lexi, so much. Um, in the introduction, um, Washner spoke about the, the, the coloring book and the cartoon. It's so two sort of um, and things because you made a very important point there regarding teacher training and the access to material. And so we're on, we on the right path to creating the, the coloring book that tells a different story. Also, a cartoon character. We all know about the Superman, the Spider-Man, and we can create a, also a kind of character to show the glorious past of, of our ancestry. And also novels. There's one novel that was done by, um, by uh, the colleague, the Kalinago Blood. It's a wonderful novel that sort of speaks about the, the, the story of, of Kalinago Warner. 
And also, we're looking at, we have to look at creating textbooks that can be referenced by teachers in terms of the, and we spoke about the videos, and also, an important point you added, the live demonstrations. So while we're capturing all of this in the sort of um, normal European sort of context, with books and videos, but also the live demonstrations are, are, are key in moving forward. And let's just say that the, the, there was a cultural renaissance in the 1970s. That cultural renaissance is what brought to the fore the California Cultural Group and, and a concept called Caribism that had, had two, that two, that had two um, prongs to it. One was poly, very political. It was called, called the Carib Liberation Movement at the time. And the other piece was very cultural um, and which evolved into the, Car the Carifuna Cultural Group. And so, Lexi, like, the call now you have in now is sort of a, another renaissance in, 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 in the 2020s to have people deep, deep into the cultural heri the culture and the heritage and to ensure that um, we, um, we dispel a lot of the, 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 the bad PR that has happened on the Carnago story. And I want to ask a, a question and to the listening audience. Um, what, what do you think uh, about changing all of the colonial names in Dominica? I think that would be a good movement. I, I have a Kainago name. I used it on my Facebook and otherwise Chubu Tuiba. I actually call my son a Kainago name. His name is Utakabu. So I'm doing my beat. Um, um, Prosper Paris, my good friend, is, is Niku Tubulu. My other good friend, Louis Patrick Hill, is Nichiabu. Um, um, Gerard Langley, the shaman, is Mabrika. And we keep building that. And, and so it's part of the language. It's not, it's not, it's not hard to say anymore. So while, while we, Dominica songs nice, but Whitey Kubu would song nicer. And all the Dominican would song nice, but Whitey Kubu would song nicer. And once you keep saying it, it becomes nice and, 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 and maybe sexy and very appealing. And so it's something we have to do. And, and maybe we can use the language, um, um, young, youngsters, to get rid of the King George V Street and call it Rabbi Sumaha. I don't know. That, that song is important. Uh, are very, very attractive. Get rid of um, all of those old colonial limbs we have. Because you see, we, we say this, and, and it's something that we need the help from the listening public and the Dominican society to understand that we, we are part of all of this. We do have a colonial past, but most of it is bloody and, and, and destructive. And simple things like a name change could do that. And so we want to throw this out here. And uh, we want to leave that charge. So folks, tonight here we've been having a, a wonderful conversation with the youth. I really, really want to thank um, the, the conversation with Chief and Devon and, and, um, and Ferdinand and Alex here. That, that ties a lot of important things. So definitely, there's going to be a retelling of the, of the Kalanago narrative, of the story. It is one that, that we know we have to hinge heavily on, on the past. And, and one that has to, to, to also lean heavily on what's happening at present. But in, in crafting the future, we, we, we see that um, we have our own views as to what is it that we want our story to be like. And, and so we are dispelling a lot of myth, uh, we are dispelling a lot of, of misinformation, and we have a, a very good um, 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 ally in, in, in Washla, who's going to put this in, in, into a, a wonderful narrative to ensure that, um, that at least we can start with having some form of reference that is different from the colonial um, reference about our people being savages and, 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 and warlike. And, and that, that sort of that sort of narrative. So I want to thank you tonight. We should wrap up. I want to thank the, 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 the moderators here. I want to thank the Emo News, thank the GIS and folks, DBS Radio for support and, and for, for recording this, this, uh, this entire evening event and, and, and the staff out of UNDP, all of the folks in the, in the UNDP family. I want to thank you tonight here and the Kyle Lago brothers who are here with us um, the, and the, the, the team out of, out of the ministry who have been assisting and they say, I really enjoy this evening. And I'm, I'm looking forward to meeting the, the, the cultural elders and the women next week as we continue the conversation on the retelling of our Kalinago culture and our Kalinago heritage. Thank you. Merci, your shy. Merci, your peel. And we have come to the end of this SSLR project discussion on Kalinago culture.
which form part of the program Indigenous Voices, which you can listen to every Friday from 7 p.m. on DBS Radio, Compliments Digicel. And um, it was a very interesting evening as we heard them from the young people of the Kalinago territory on what it is that they would like to see improve and develop within the, the, the um, community and you know to ensure that the heritage and the culture remains alive and well and it was a very informative discussion and you listen you heard it here on dbs radio 88.1 as well as on the dbs facebook page so on behalf of the technical team dean dennis and aaron my name is james rodney signing off from dbs radio and taking you back to master control and mr mix for the rest of the friday evenings proceedings with the Creole music and Kadas and everything nice. So Mr. Mix, take it away at Master Control. Good night, everybody.